Welcome to another episode of God, yay or nay. Today I'm here with author of We Can Do This, Lori Morales. Lori, thanks for joining me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, this is uh, interesting. So uh, <laughs> I think I should uh, open up by telling everybody you used to be my gym teacher back in middle <laughs> school. <laughs> Way back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no, it was awesome. We uh, ran into each other. Um, just like oh, I do my walks around the lakes just uh, every once in a while. And I saw you biking and uh, found out you wrote this book. And honestly, this book is just so up so much up my alley because I'm kind of going through this with my family right now. My dad just had a stroke um, mm -hmm. back in Christmas. He's been in long term care since then. So it's been over nine months now. And it's just, yeah, uh, yeah it's so tough on the family. And uh, when I remember when you told me about your book I'm not gonna lie a part of me was like all right like I, I do want to get you on the podcast but I kind of want to wait just because all the shit's <laughs> yeah. too fresh for me right now yeah and I don't yeah, really want to be talking heavy. about it yeah but um when I started reading your book I'm like wow this is honestly something I wish I read so much quicker because it is just something that prepares you for these situations and these situations happen to all of us like yeah mm -hmm. and I, I love it so please uh just tell my audience why you wrote the book. Like, what is it for? Well, okay. So what happened, I guess this is going to be five, at least five or six more, about six years ago now. I are actually almost seven, I guess. Um, my, my mom had um, had cancer two years previous to her third diagnosis and she ended up with bone cancer. And so eventually she ended up in a hospice. In the meantime, um, we started noticing that my dad was, was getting dementia, which he was later diagnosed as vascular, he passed away from vascular dementia, which is of course, you know, your heart and there's not enough oxygen to the brain. And, and, um, and so we were juggling that and there were lots of things going on in my life and I was just, just retiring. And I'm the oldest of six children. And because I live close to my parents, it falls, of course, upon me to go, oh, okay, what are we going to do with mom and dad? So I started researching and trying to find out, you know, like um, when mom and dad were living in their uh, condo, we had home care come in, but then it got to be too much. My mom was in too much pain ended up she ended up in a hospice and of course eventually passing but she was very worried about my dad because he could not stay by himself and so we were all taking turns living there and as close even as I am they were in Calgary and so we decided we needed to start looking for places which we did and started researching and it just was overwhelming and it was and, and so I kept saying to myself there's got to be like one place where you can go, not Alberta Health Services, although there's some good resources there, but some somebody's got a story. And the more people I talked to, they were like, oh, yes, well, you should hear what happened to me. And oh, this happened and you should try this. And I said, well, I, I really think I need to put it together. And of course, being a teacher and <laughs> retired, I, um, I decided that I needed as well to uh, figure things out on my own and organize things. So I recruited a friend who was going through the same thing to look up some resources. So that's her portion at the end of the book. And I decided that I needed to really get going. So in the meantime, while I'm writing the book, my brother passed away, my mother passed away, and my, my father was in a home in the High River here at Seasons. and. Um, when he passed away, I hadn't quite finished the book. And so even when I finished the book, I had to go back and, and um, change a few things. But I collected a lot of stories. And then to talk about uh, Providence, Divine Intervention, I was needing a break. Uh, my dad passed away in uh, September. And I went down to Palm Springs in uh, November, at the beginning of November. And crazy as it sounds, I'm at the pool one day and there's a lady from the States and she said, oh, who are you? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, get chatting. And she said, oh, would you like to come for supper with us tonight? We're going um, for supper with a gentleman and he's just written a book. 
And I said, oh, well, I'm writing a book too. And she said, oh, well, you'll have lots to talk about. And I said, oh, well, what's his book about? And she said, I think it's something about like uh, aging parents. And I said, what? So long story short, I ended up, um, he, he did um, one of the, uh, you know, uh, on the back here, uh, one of the explanations for the book. But anyway, he, uh, his name was Dick Edwards and he worked for the uh, Mayo Clinic. He was retired. He was in his 70s. And he wrote a book called Mom, Dad, Can We Talk? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm writing a book. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And so we got conversing. And he really gave me lots of different advice and said, yeah, you need to, you know, share people's stories. Here's, you know, um, you know, what you need to do. And Here's, you know, getting a hold of a publisher and getting this out there and doing some workshops and it just, you know, the whole deal. So mm -hmm. that's where, and then I ended up finishing the book and then some friends came online and, and helped me with the publishing part of it. And yeah. And then of course my book launch was March the 6th. And then I think COVID happened March 10th. Ha, 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 so, ha, ha, good time. Like, hey, okay. people there can we go. Uh, now they, how do we reorganize, right? Yeah, so they had time to read at least. So that's uh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I like this whole idea, like, because it's true. Like, we don't talk about these things beforehand. No. And that's right. And even you mentioned in the book, like, our, the Western society, our population is aging, right? Yes. Yeah. Statistically, I think there will be in by 20, what is it? 32, a third of the population will be having some kind, well, they will be in a home. They will have some kind of a medical condition or are just the aging society. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, these are topics like we should like actually think about beforehand. And like, I don't know, why do you think we like, I guess that's just human nature. Eh? We just wait until the crisis happens and then we just yeah. start like doggy pedaling. Well, people don't think it's going to happen to them, right? It's like, oh, I'll do it when I'm you know, older. And then suddenly it happens. And my book was was written to, you know, just let people know that this is about pre-planning. So my parents, before they passed away, they, uh, they gave us in their will, all funeral expenses, everything was taken care of. Their gravesite, their tombstone. My mom even had time to tell us the song she wanted at her funeral back mm -hmm. in the day when you could get to, anyway, those, all those things were in place. And they said the reason they did that was because they wanted us to grieve when they didn't want us having to be fighting over the estate to be worried about what to do, about what we should do. Everything was taken care of. And honestly, it was their gift to us. And what a blessing, because a lot of people, when I talked to uh, the funeral director in town here, um, Craig, he said to me that the most problems happen when people are sitting at the funeral home, like families, and they're fighting, he said, because no, mom said she wanted to be cremated. And then another Try, you know, another sibling will say, no, she didn't. And, you know, there's, and you don't need that kind of stress because you're in the middle of something that you're trying to, you know, you're trying to lay your parents to, 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 to uh, rest. Mm -hmm. So, and like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's, uh, that's very true. So like, besides maybe like all these, um, like when you're talking about will funeral and stuff like that, yeah. Um, that what other conversations do you think we should be having with like our parents or the elderly like when they're before like can like just before with like well, any of the crisis has happened yeah so I mean that's the extreme that's death right but mm -hmm. there are lots of things so for example health um, or mom and dad you know having the, like saying uh, you notice something in the house like I always I call them red flags so Things like you notice my dad would put socks in the cutlery drawer or he'd get up at four o'clock in the morning and he'd go, oh, I have to go. My mom would say, where are you going? And he'd say, oh, I'm going out to help with the harvest. And she'd be like, well, they haven't come yet. Just go back to bed. <laughs> but I think, you know, there's lots of situations where, um, you know, like I said, I think people, if they notice things, start educating yourself. So whether that be looking for a home 
and, and talking with your parents. There's nothing worse, I think, than going into, you know, I mean, I'm getting older or whatever, but I don't want my kids coming in and saying, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. I have a life and I, I should be able to make some of those choices. But I remember my mom saying, um, you know, the day we took her to the hospice and she said, no, no, I can handle it. We said, mom, your safety and dad's safety is in jeopardy here you this is about you know keeping you safe this isn't about our decision um so i think if you you know put it forward to a, a parent and say we want to do what's best in your interest but we would like to talk to you about it and making them feel part of the conversation because that that's it's about dignity too right and uh, yeah dignity because yeah like it's weird when the when your parents age and like if they go through something like like some sort of diseases, like we're talking about, um, you see the roles kind of reverse all of a sudden, you kind of feel yes. like you're becoming the parent and then they're yeah, like kind of are. becoming the children. And like, ah, like I, I remember when uh, my dad was at the last facility he was at, we were finally getting him to walk a little bit. And like when we started, he was his whole left side was paralyzed. So that when he yeah. started finally walking, we got him on a rail and he was walking. And I was like helping him out. And I know. And like uh, one day he, we just both started laughing because like the way we were doing it, it was like, he's like, oh, I used to teach you the exact same way yeah. because I'm like, yeah. dad, left leg, left yeah. leg, dad. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> it's very true. I remember my dad tying up his shoelaces. And he's like, I remember teaching you how to tie your shoes, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah. So how do you, like when you're, because like, I guess when you kind of end up moving into becoming like a caregiver for your parents. Yeah. So like, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that? Because um, the one thing that kills me right now is like seeing my dad's depression, because I can see it coming and going. And he's like a really strong man. And I know he's uh, trying his best to like... Uh, deal with that because he cares mostly about his family as well but like when you see that kind of stuff like do you have any advice mm -hmm. to help with that yeah I guess what I I mean I'm sort of a Pollyanna as it is but I would go visit my dad every day and just share with him just different things about life and trying to do um, things for him, take him for a drive every Sunday and take him for a drive, just trying to brighten up his life. Because I guess the thing about caregiving, though, is the balance. So you yourself can feel and I know I did, I remember hitting the wall. But you know, it's about balance in your life. So, um, you know, physically, you know, getting your exercise and your sunshine. And if you can share that by taking them for a walk, or, you know, getting them outside, um, the other thing is eating well, you know, just your nutrition and, and, you know, keeping yourself healthy. And of course, the last one is the emotional and spiritual part. And I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm a woman of faith, and I do a lot of praying and reading my Bible and devotions and things and keeping myself in balance and really, you know, just trying to see the brighter side of things instead of um, you know, like I say, when you, my dad would get very negative. I remember going to a restaurant one day and, and he was in a bit of a grumpy mood and, and we were waiting for the waitress to come and, and where is she? And he, and my dad could get quite, you know, like rude to people because, mm -hmm. it, you know, there's no filter. Right. And I remember saying, you know, maybe this girl has three children and Maybe she had to get them off to school and one of them was sick and she had to come to work and, you know, trying to make him see, you know, there are way worse situations than you sitting here having to wait for the waitress to come, that kind of thing. <laughs> and just, uh, and I call it squirrel a lot of times too, right? Do you remember in the movie Up, you know, Doggy or whatever, it was squirrel and, and try to get their mind away from the negative parts and try and focus on like a project or something like when I was um, before the, I guess, pre COVID days, I went to the school after I retired. And I said, are there kids that are having trouble reading? I would love to take a group of them over to my dad's senior home and read with them. And it, we, we did that for two or three years or whatever, you know, till we couldn't go in there anymore. And I even carried it on after dad passed away, because I think it's just really important that uh, seniors days get filled with uh, just positive things, right? And 
there's nothing better than doing something for someone else to make someone take someone's mind off what's going on in their life. Right. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I, I like yeah. how you said, changing the focus. I think that's good for anybody who's having any kind of depression, even young people. Like uh, when I go to visit my dad, like I can tell when he's had a day where yeah. he's just focusing on all the negative stuff and yeah. like, yeah, it, it turns out like yeah. my whole visiting comes to be like, all right, come on, let's see something positive. Let's see something positive. But, uh, yeah, that's right. It mm-hmm. can be a little rough. Uh, actually, maybe I could ask you this. Uh, this is one thing I've been like kind of having issues with myself. Like um, my career was in Toronto before this whole thing happened. And like I like I want to go back to Toronto. Your life has been turned upside down yeah, for a short and like, while. Uh, yeah, and I'm uh, I'm here, and I'm like I'm fine with that, and I I kind of accepted that. I think I'm going to be mostly here until at least next year, and uh, I, I'm fine with that, and like I'm sticking around for the family. But um, there is that part of me is like ah, I want to go back to Toronto. Like, uh, how do yeah. you deal with that like whole life like going upside down? Well, I I just looked at it like my dad was what eighty eight. And I mean, if I can give, he gave me, you know, the first 18 years of my life. And Mm. if I just need to be able to understand that he's not going to be here forever. So what time I can spend with him, that was really important. And with my mom too. And I have a girlfriend, she's been looking after her dad for, she thought it would just be a year and it's been like five, I think now, but she said every moment that we're together I mean she yeah, she gets frustrated and she you know whatever but she she just said you know I I just am learning so much about him and it's really cool so that might be an idea for a project or something or is a you know going through some of your old photos and you know putting together kind of you know your life your dad's life uh, history and I know my dad we did that too we sat down and he had already started writing his life history and he had his father's and it's just so interesting, you know, just recording those things. And um, I'm part of, um, I'm a volunteer with um, Simply Compassion Advocacy Society. And it's a group of people outside or in Okotoks. And what we do is we advocate for seniors. And a lot of what we're trying to do is like bring music into the residents, you know, like these are care homes, mind you. But I mean, even in a house, I mean, home visits, like, you know, put the music on, do a little dancing, uh, put some pictures up, make the place brighter, um, do some little projects, um, you know, just, I think just positive things. So, so just think about it as it is a little piece of the pie in the big, big uh, pan of your life, you know, Mm. like, I guess that's, that's the way to see it too, right? Yeah, and you're right. Like, uh, it, it it comes like you have to have a little bit more like empathy. I think. I think when you yeah. talk about uh, being like caregiving in any sense, like uh, when you become like a caregiver, or, like even like forced into the position by circumstance, like it does make oh, yeah. you like more of a like more empathetic. And like, there's benefits to it, and then there's hardships to it too. Like, uh, maybe you, can you go into it a little bit? Yeah. So sometimes, like, I begrudge the fact, like. Um, you know, because I was the oldest, why did it fall on me? And then, you know, um, and things like I would take my dad and, and he'd had a few accidents here and there, and it was embarrassing and just lots of that kind of stuff. And, um, it really, I mean, I guess when my mom was alive and she was trying to deal with it, with her pain, that really set me to wanting to really help because I didn't want it all to fall on her. And I guess part of it is just that whole, um, you know, just keeping yourself in balance. I really think that's important, even regardless if you're going through something, you know, Um, and a support group, that is huge. So I have five siblings, uh, well, four. uh, And what we did was we did a lot of uh, talking together. What can we do to make the load lighter? Um, There were other people like my mom and dad were uh, belonged to a church in Calgary. And there was a ladies group there that really helped out a lot. They would go visit my mom and stuff in the hospice. And just so I think what you really I, I call it, just find your tribe, find the people that you can go to and laugh when you just feel like there's days when you just sort of want to, you know, scream into the wind. 
and go and and people you know uh, to go and walk with and share and people want to tell their stories a lot of us are going through different things and you would be surprised at how much uh, how similar many of those situations really are in terms of how to deal with with the battles in our life mm-hmm. no that's i think that's great advice yeah thank you for that <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. i have you got uh, a tribe i'm yeah, sure you have a tribe yes. i think my uh, comedy uh, people are my tribe on it and i yeah. got like a lot of good friends and stuff like i'm lucky especially i'm not gonna lie calgary is like where all my like f- uh, friends and family are like for the most part i have a ton of that in toronto too but in calgary yeah. it's like i i got that uh I got that in abundance, thankfully. Um, so I, I lots I do, of laughter, medicine. Yeah. Laughter is the best medicine. Well, no, and luckily that's what I do at night. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah. no, I'm lucky in that way. And honestly, that's I share awesome. your I uh, share your pain with being the oldest sibling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Screw all the younger siblings. That's my uh, that's right. My so when you get old, don't assume that everybody's going to want to jump up and take over and ha, help ha, you out, ha, right? Ha, 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 ha. Uh, no, I get that. Um, yeah. How about like uh, with like, uh, cause I remember in the, in your book, you were even talking about sometimes you have couples and like one of the parents of like one mm. of the couples, you know, they need the care, but yeah. like, and like, it might be like, like they don't have the money to do it. So it's like, should we move them in? But the other co- person in the couple is like, hell no, I don't need this right now. Like, yeah, I mean, like how do those situations, those can be messy or what? Yeah, they, they can be. It really, I think, depends on the family and the approach. Um, you know, so I think, again, it goes back to those conversations and just say, you know, mom and dad, we need we need to sit and have a have a conversation. And as much as, you know, um, as much as parents don't maybe want to talk about it. So before uh, I guess it was about a year ago, I did some workshops and we Um, we talked about exactly what you're talking about. And it's very interesting that a lot of situations are very unique. So to give you a blanket sort of answer, it really depends on um, the couple and whether they are open to having that conversation. Because there are some families, nope, we're on the farm and we'll be here till we die, you know. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other ones like, oh, we're looking at this really nice, you know, retirement home for both of us. So you get literally the extremes. And then you get, like you say, the one where the, you know, the health concerns get to be great. And uh, sometimes like home care can come in. Alberta Health Services does have um, some very good things in place in terms of uh, caseworkers. So I would suggest that if somebody is like a medical condition, like even if your dad came home, there would be a caseworker and somebody to come into the home to keep checking to make sure, you know, that that his needs are being met. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, those all vary. And even when you're looking at homes, some of them, they have um, like that they're called leveled homes. So you have like independent living. So that's just, you know, you can you can live on your own, but you're just a senior and uh, maybe you need help with your medication. And then you've got the extreme where you have, um, you know, memory care. So, uh, you know, perhaps somebody needs to be in a different part of the building. And I know there's lots of facilities, uh, you know, just within even, I know my girlfriend, her mom just recently passed away, but her husband had dementia or had Alzheimer's. And so she could go see him once in a while in the same building but she lived independently till, till she passed. So there's lots of scenarios and it, each one is so unique, mm. but there is funding too for seniors that, um, you know, need assistance. And it's, it's all on the Alberta web, website, Alberta health website. And as well too, there are lots of people that choose to, you know, stay in their own home, which they do suggest and just get home care to come in. And, but it gets expensive, right? So it depends on, yeah, that's yeah, why yeah, that planning should be kind of done beforehand because like yes. you're right, you're right. Like, uh, and uh, oh yeah, and do a budget and say yeah, can we afford this? Because in some cases it isn't an option, and there are government facilities. They're not the greatest. I 
don't mm-hmm. think, but if worst case scenario, I mean, you're covered, you'd be covered, right? So yeah, no, and mm-hmm. um, no, and I, I've kind of seen that now, like going through this whole thing, I've noticed like the government agencies, like they do the job and like they, yeah. they like they, but like at the end of the day, it is like, um, it's a job. Yeah. And it's not, um, it's not like when you go to a private care place, like yeah, it costs way more care. money. Yeah. It costs way more money, but it, um, mm-hmm. there's benefits to it in a, some sense, like, especially with my dad, my dad right now needs therapy. So like at, yep. the, at the government place, they do the therapy and they do all right, but it's like, it's just the minimum and it's like, yeah. all right, like we, but that's because they have so many people to deal with. Like, I'm not really like saying this is oh, a bad without thing. a question. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the health, I mean, yeah, with everything going on in the healthcare system right now, I, they're overwhelmed with lots of stuff. Right? Exactly. So I'm, I, but like, if you go to the private place and pay like a ton of money, you'll get a uh, much yeah. better tra- therapy and like hopefully a faster recovery and like, yeah, so it is interesting. And yeah. like the other thing you mentioned in the books, like um, like a lot of the stuff you talk about is Alberta and Canada, but like I know I have a lot of people listening uh, in the States and like around the world and stuff as well. Like laws are different everywhere and yeah. uh, what they provide is different everywhere, what you might get from your government or what you might get for assistance, the prices, like all of this shit is different and you yeah, should kind so, of look at it you're in your own well area. it's good to look at it beforehand right because you don't want this big surprise like oh there's a thousand dollars in the savings account and we're going to this high-end facility it's not working right so being aware of those things and you know and and being being um you know like like i said being the advocate that you can be for your parent in case they come to that point where they can't be mm-hmm. mm. no I, uh, that's interesting um, mm-hmm. do you mind sharing a little bit about like the process of dementia, just because like, I know how like hard this could be for a lot of people. And like, this is something that, um, you said in your book, uh, the mm-hmm. numbers are going down, like in the percentage of the population that are getting, uh, like dementia and Alzheimer's, which is a great thing to hear. Like we're doing some good in that sense, but still a lot of people suffer from oh, yeah. this and it's, it's extremely hard, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, you know, the biggest thing probably with that is, you know, health. Um, You know, there are things that you natural things that you can take and, and, you know, so myself, I mean, I'm close to 65, but I have started taking, you know, some different herbs and different things to help with memory. And uh, the other thing about, you know, I mean, on that end, but my, my mom started keeping a journal and I tell people this, if you start noticing things, you know, because it was years before my dad was diagnosed that my mom was noticing things like, you know, there's forgetful and then there's like, don't even remember, right. Mm -hmm. Telling the same story four times. Did I do that? And then one day my dad got in the car and he got lost and he couldn't find his way home. And, um, I, he did eventually, but he was lost for hours. And my mom was worried sick. So, you know, things like that. So start keeping a diary, I say, and documenting so that when you actually go to get tested, you actually have some evidence of what is going on. And the other thing is training and educate yourself. So I've taken a number of courses on um, dementia and Alzheimer training. And those, some of them are free. I know we offer that through our advocacy society, but you can do a lot of reading on your own, which is what I did. Um, Just get some books out of the library, go on the internet, um, you know, talk to your doctor. And often when you go into the doctor with your your parent, um, you know, it's having those conversations and saying, yeah, we're really noticing some things. And so... The other thing to do is when they do get it, like I remember one day my dad, he, the girls called me and said, your dad is down at the front desk and he's adamant that he's going fishing. He's got his coat on and he's waiting for your brother. And I said, okay, I'll come over. And um, my dad said, where, where is Tim? Where is he? And I said, well, dad, he didn't, you get the message? Yeah, he wasn't, he had to go into work today. So you're going to have to go another day. Why don't we just go back up to your room? And so it's the worst thing you can do with a person with Alzheimer's and dementia is say, no, 
you're not going fishing. Uh, you're out of your mind. Like uh, it's, it's the middle of winter and you know what I mean? Like, and try to dissuade them. So the idea oh, is just okay. to go along with them. And when my dad would get up in the middle of the night, my mom would say, oh, you know what? I bet they're going to come in a couple hours. Why don't you just come back and, you know, into, why don't you just lay down for a while? And she wouldn't, well, you know, she'd just have him lay down and he'd fall asleep again because it was four o'clock in the morning. Right? Exactly. So, and so, yeah, so that's a big piece of like the training part of it and understanding that they they don't understand. The hardest part is my aunt, she just passed away. She, uh, she was 91 and she had Alzheimer's for probably 10 years. And the last five years, she uh, didn't recognize anyone. And so her daughters found it very difficult to go and see her because yeah, you're, you aren't, you know, you, they, they don't recognize you. Yeah, right. And so my dad hard. would look at me and think I was my mom sometimes, you know, Mm -hmm. and you know so it's, it's just a lot of uh you know just like I say educating yourself and learning you know how to deal with it because um if it happens and and some people get aggressive my dad was kind of like the pussycat kind he'd get angry once in a while because you he couldn't figure out stuff I remember one time I went and he had all his uh um uh, what do you call it waste baskets full of water and I was like what's what's up dad and he's like well the horses the horses needed watering and I couldn't find the pail so and you know you'd think you've gone crazy but I remember when he first started getting it like he'd say to me you know I I know something's wrong I feel like I'm losing my mind but I don't know what it is so you have to yeah and of course what is it the notebook is that the movie that everybody watches yeah yeah, uh, yeah so you know mm -hmm, yeah it's losing losing a person yeah it's, 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 it's very difficult it's very difficult honestly and like uh just visiting my dad at the care center now all the time um the one thing i didn't notice is like i started even talking with other people there and like uh my dad will tell me stories about other people there and then you start realizing yeah. you're like oh wow like my dad's story yeah. is like one of the best stories in this whole building you're like geez like and like I, i've always noticed like the dementia patients are the hardest ones because like it yeah. gets to that point where it's like it's really hard to even visit them like um and I could, yeah, oh, yeah. Actually, that would be just so tough. I well, guess. they can't find words for things and yeah, it's, yeah, but there is training like for it. So if, if, you know, if people do, you know, I, I would recommend them taking some training. It really helps a lot because then you will be less frustrated, I believe. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, I'm like the other thing that's always kind of on my mind now too, is like, if I'm not sure, like when my dad's going to come home. And the other part of it is like, I don't want to leave my mom alone either because like, yes. I know she's never been alone for so long. I'm like, you know, it's just like, you know, you get both of those things coming. You're like, oh, yeah, geez. so I call it the vice grip. And then you have people that have families, young families or families, and they're trying to do a career, a family, and then mom and dad. So they say the sandwich and I say sandwich, nothing. This is the vice grip. Mm. You know, you're caught in between these worlds, right? And you're trying to, yeah, help everybody out, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess family and uh, family is a, probably a lot more, uh, a lot more busier than a podcast and a comedy career. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's always somebody worse off than you are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and honestly, like uh, going through this whole time has just been like uh, learning to shift my perspective a lot, and um, like you said, like learning to uh, take care of your mental health, like. Because yes. this is this has been the first time in my life where it's like I've I've always been like a mental health guy. I love meditation. I love like these kind of yes. spirituality stuff. And but this has been the first time in my life where it's like I got to make I sure need it. I and every day like it's like I, every yes. day I need to be because like before I would be like okay like I love my mental health but hey on the weekends I can go drink yeah. and have some fun let loose and then I can wake up hungover and it's no big deal you know but. Yeah, I can't do that anymore. It's like I need to be, I need to be, I need to be good, like and mentally yeah, focused, clear yeah. and focused, like mm -hmm. every day. So it, it becomes like an everyday thing. And but like I also, it's been like good for me, also in that sense. Like I, I'm learning that, or I can see that I'm growing. And uh, 
Yeah. And, and another suggestion, sorry, is, is fine. Like when I talk about the tribe, find people that are empathetic and you can download on, right? Because it's almost like, um, you know, they're, you, you really need to talk about it. And when they talk, um, I did some trauma training and they were talking about the best thing you can do is talk about it, get it. You have, you should write it down, but the first thing you should do is you should be able to talk about it and just sort of, you know, right. So Mm -hmm. that's important yeah actually I remembered your book you said something about a death cafe is like what are what are these things <laughs> yeah I, yeah yeah like it's, this is a cafe where people talk freely about these topics yeah and 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 it's too bad that people are so fearful of death you know it's inevitable we're we we take our first breath and we take our last breath and and uh you know, to be able, to, I mean, I remember sitting with some friends one night and one of the guys said, so casket or urn? And everybody just like, what? You know, <laughs> like <laughs> during a dinner conversation. And he said, no, like, honestly. And, and it's very interesting because, uh, you know, even like I said, I know that there have been situations where, you know, I mean, people just don't discuss those things, but I think it's important that people freely talk about uh, something that could be quite beautiful. You know, when my mom passed, it was a blessing. She was in so much pain that, you know, she just wanted to go home. She didn't want to be around, right? Mm. And when quality of life becomes such that you don't, you're not capable of making decisions or being able to move or speak or talk or whatever it is, it, it makes a difference. Mm. So, and uh yeah and like you were even talking about like uh when it comes to like having a funeral and stuff like that like there is an importance to the whole ceremony of doing that right like of having a funeral and stuff like it really is yeah, it's beneficial. for the living it is yeah. for the living mm -hmm. yeah because we need that whole process to like kind of process it and we do and like actually learn like i don't know like uh well, it's closure, right? It's saying closure. goodbye. Yeah. And I think, you know, when some people say, oh, I don't want anything, you know, well, you're not around to mm -hmm. see. And, you know, and it was funny because my, um, I was just at a wedding up in uh, Northern Alberta and, and uh, my parents have a grave site at uh, Sherwood Park and my brother and I stopped there. And uh, my, uh, my parents are both there and there's a, there's a tombstone. And it, it's just beautiful to just sit there and, you know, it's, it's so peaceful and serene and you just, you know, and the last time we were there, you know, a, um, um, a pair of Canadian goose geese flew over and it was just, you know, it was really spiritual. And my brother was cremated and my sister-in-law took his ashes and we were just saying, it feels, it feels weird because there's no place to go do you know what I mean I don't know if that makes sense but you know just to just to go and and commemorate I don't know I mean we had a funeral for him and everything but I said maybe we need to put a bench here you know oh, just somewhere okay. to sit and you know never, just to remember those I never thought about past. that yeah yeah I never thought yeah. about that like that's something but like I guess if you have a cremated in the urn a lot of people just kind of put it up on their fireplace or something yeah like that, exactly right? and i guess it's yeah but you want to be there. careful what was that what was ben stiller what was that movie ha, ha, yeah that Meet movie yeah. Ha, 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 not sober though <laughs> no, yeah. and i i've heard some crazy stories about some of those yeah but yeah anyway. you know, i think i remember <laughs> I yeah think another comedy movie they made it into a milkshake or something like that <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah yeah making light of it mm -hmm. yeah yeah no kidding mm -hmm. um that is like interesting like um my one of my yeah. like uh best friends in comedy Andrew Albert he just passed away a few weeks ago unfortunately oh, I'm sorry yeah and um it was interesting like uh the comedians like around the country we all like pretty much like put together like shows uh in our own cities raise money for the family and stuff like that but like oh. um, that whole process of like going to these shows and like everybody kind of going up doing like some comedy and then also talking about Andrew and like saying something like you know saying something what he meant to us or yeah. like, heartfelt or just like that kind of thing it like it was such a 
like you said, closure. It was like yeah. it gave us, uh, it gave all, it brought all of us closer together as well. Like I know, all and what a people... tribute to him too, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, it was like, uh, it was good. So like, it is true. Like these, uh, these ceremonies are uh, like there's yeah. a, such an importance to them, and uh, even like, uh, like it just kind of like gives more importance to your birthdays and stuff too. Like every year, you're like, yeah, like let's celebrate these things. You know, there's mm-hmm. too much in the world that is so negative that you can. We need to, yeah, celebration of life and birthdays and yeah, all those amazing situations where we can get excited. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's uh, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, all right, Lori, I got to ask you the question of the podcast. So, uh, oh. Lori Morales, God, yay or nay? Always God. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I had a feeling. Always God. I had a feeling. <laughs> Actually, one thing I was interested in just now that I asked that question, um, do you see kind of any differences in people when they go through these situations with faith yes. or without faith? Yes. Uh, yes. People that I, I do, be, I, I believe the people that don't have faith aren't sure about a lot of things, I believe. And, you know, a belief in God. And of course, I believe in, in heaven and hell. And I believe that there is a, is a place after death. Mm. And I think that's the biggest, biggest thing. When you have a hope, you know that you are going um, you know, to be with the Lord, that makes a huge difference because you have a peace. And when my mom passed away, um, it was about six o'clock in the morning, about five thirty-six. the nurse called me, I was at home and my mom was in a hospice in Calgary. And she said, your mom is going to go very, very soon. Get here now. And it was dawn and I drove like mad to get there. And I got to spend the last hour of my mom, you know, with her, right? And it was just, you know, if anybody's ever had that experience, they can uh, understand that it was beautiful. It was peaceful. I was able to, you know, just sing some songs and pray over her. And and she, she had wanted to go for a number of weeks. She was in a lot of pain. And it was a beautiful thing. And even now... I just feel her, you know, lots of times, but I have a girlfriend whose husband um, was in a hospice and she said there were times when people were dying and they were screaming. They were, you know, it was horrible. It was a horrible death. And so I really believe that people, you know, when you get to the end of your life, you want to be able to close your eyes and say, that, um, you know, that I have a faith and that there is a God and I'm going to be with him. And, and, you know, I mean, the Bible says I am the way, the truth and the life. There is life. There is life after death. And, and I know people from many different faiths. I know that everybody has that, but the people that do have a faith do, I believe, um, handle it better. Mm, It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of interesting too. Like I've, I've noticed sometimes like, in the final years is like where people kind of come back to faith, even if they like yes. lived a life with, uh, out it. I'm kind of uh, like in that part where I'm not too religious anymore, but I'm very spiritual and I kind of believe in like, I'm very, I have a live a life with a lot of faith in me. So like, I do know that, but I, I know also like a lot of people who don't, but I know when they've had like near death experiences or stuff like that, oh, they, yeah. they, they come back to wake that up be- call. It is. And like, it, I don't know, it is, it's, it's tough. It's like, it, you get to the point where, when you start thinking about death a lot, that it, it feels very, uh, you know, yeah. you really start thinking about what happens afterwards. Right. Well, and it's the choices you make too. So I, I know I write for a, a senior magazine and I have a blog on my website and I often refer to, you know, different scriptures and things like that. And, and I guess, like I said, it's about even, um, you know, when you get, to, like I said, when you get to the end of your life and it could be any day. So I, I don't know if I have tomorrow. So it's about living each day and making the world a different and a better place. Like, it's not about me. It's about other people. Like I always say, Rick Warren, um, that's his first line. It's not about you. 
So, mm -hmm. and like, what are you they, doing? yeah. And it, honestly, it's been helping my parents out too. They're both like, we're, we're Muslims and like, they're both very religious. And like, I noticed yeah. that like, uh, like, cause my mom and dad can't be together like every night, like they used to for the last fucking how many years, like, yes. you know, now they're just like, uh, like they pray every night together yes. over the phone and stuff. And like, you can, isn't that I a can, beautiful thing? It, I, I honestly, I'm very impressed. And like, even with my dad, because my mom's always been the most religious person in the household. And uh, mm. my, my dad, I think uh, he's been that, but like, you know, it's, ne it's never been like a huge part of his identity or his character or anything, but it's uh, this whole. Well, that's, yeah. Well, and he has time. And like mm. what you said before, like with your meditation, that's, be that's wonderful. People, the spirit, I guess, the spirit of, your soul is what you really need to be at peace with and you know being that in connecting with the spirit is absolutely crucial mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. and uh yeah it's uh it's an interesting process and uh i really do uh i hope people uh, grab your book and just um yeah especially if their parents are kind of getting up there this is such a good book to really uh read and just kind of like oh, have yeah. these conversations so uh yeah please uh all right we can do yeah, this. yeah it's on amazon and you can get it at freeze and press and uh and i have copies if you you know just message me or whatever on instagram author laurie morales or just my email and i ship them out or send them or deliver them or whatever too so mm -hmm. awesome and it's uh we can do this uh yep. Lorraine Morales is on the yeah uh, on Lorraine, the... my official title but I go as Lori right ha, 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 yeah ha, ha. and uh adult children and aging parents planning for success that's my subtitle so that's yeah. awesome and uh yeah I wish you all the best and uh yeah thank you yeah so and much you again. as well with your parents and all of the stress and struggles and you know just hang in there and uh you're doing the right thing you know no, so, I appreciate God that. God bless uh, you. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Laura. This was awesome. Okay. You bet.